Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing CRISPR therapeutic stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. CRISPR Therapeutics is a biotechnology company. One of the co-founders of the company shared the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020. Her name is Emmanuelle Charpentier. She provided the first scientific documentation on the development and use of CRISPR gene editing. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. This allows DNA to be specifically modified and exchanged, which can prevent diseases. The company's plan is to apply this new technology commercially and advance research. They have several drugs in development. One of these include CTX-001. This is for the treatment of the rare blood disorders thalassemia and sickle cell disease, which is being developed jointly with Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Early clinical trial results support the safety and efficacy of this treatment. Starting in 2016, CRISPR and Bayer operated a joint venture called Caspia Therapeutics. Now that entire joint venture is consolidated into CRISPR's company. Kathy Woods is a big fan and investor of this company. The company is headquartered in Zug, Switzerland and was founded in 2013. Although it does conduct R&D in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It trades on the NASDAQ, Deutsche Börse, Mexican Bolsa and London Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid cap company, 6.2 billion market cap. They're trading at $82 a share and they have 77 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So they did have lots of free cash flow in trailing 12 months, nearly half a billion dollars. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that also peaked in a trailing 12 months at over 400 million. Revenue is a sales for the company. 2019, they had a good amount of revenue, almost none in 2020. But in the trailing 12 months, it was over 900 million. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is their operating expenses. And then below that is their operating income, which was positive in 2019 and the trailing 12 months, negative in 2018 and 2020. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which was their highest ever by far in the trailing 12 months. This is their income statement from their latest quarterly report. This is the first nine months of 2020 versus the first nine months of 2021 and the third quarter of 2020 versus the third quarter of 2021. They had under $1 million of revenue in the third quarter. In the first nine months of 2021, that's where all their revenue was, over 900 million. And most of it was collaboration with Vertex. The company mentions their revenue is mainly derived from collaborations with Vertex. Vertex is one of the largest biopharmaceutical companies in the world. They have a market cap of over $56 billion. They also mention we do not expect to sustain our profitability in future years. They spend over $100 million of research and development in the third quarter. And this is all related to their agreement with Vertex. And they spend $25 million of general and administrative expenses. Examples are payroll and rent. They have negative operating income in the third quarter. They did have a big positive in the first nine months of 2021. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates or loses from its operational business. They spent the most in CapEx in the trailing 12 months, 79 million. CapEx are investments in property, plant, and equipment. I'll show you their breakdown of CapEx later when we look at their balance sheet. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And they did have a big positive in the trailing 12 months. But before the trailing 12 months, they've been mainly losing money. So they've been funding their business on equity. They raised 307 million of equity in 2018, 415 million, 1 billion, and 600 million. Every time a company issues common stock, it dilutes the current shareholders. It makes sure shares less valuable. This is their operating cash flows from their quarterly report. This is the first nine months of 2020 versus the first nine months of 2021. And the way you calculate operating cash flows, you start with your net income or net loss, 
Then you have to add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement, then adjust for changes in working capital. We start with the gain of 519 million. We add back 11.7 million of depreciation. We add back 77 million of stock-based compensation. When companies give stock to their employees, that brings down their net income, but it's a non-cash item, so we add it back here on the statement of cash flows. And then changes in working capital. They had a cash outflow of 19 million from prepaid expenses. I'll show you the prepaid expenses later when we look at the balance sheet. They had a cash inflow of 14 million from accounts payable, so they bought items on credit. They had a cash inflow of 20 million from operating lease assets and liabilities. I'll talk about this in a little more detail later when we look at the balance sheet. Even though they reported an accounting profit of 519 million, they actually generated 625 million of cash flow. In the first nine months of 2020, they reported an accounting loss of 242 million, but they actually lost 157 million of cash flow. This is their investing and financing section. This is the first nine months of 2020 versus the first nine months of 2021. In the investing section, the top line is CapEx, investments in property, plant, and equipment. They spent 73 million. Last year it was 12 million. Lots of companies buy marketable securities. Instead of sitting on cash, they want to earn a little interest. So they bought 1.4 billion of marketable securities. These are usually highly liquid investments, like commercial paper or treasury bonds. 432 million of marketable securities matured. So they had a cash outflow of 1 billion in their investing section. In their financing section, they raised 213 million from issuing stock. Last year, they raised 582 million. They also sell stock to their employees at a discount. They raised 31 million from selling stock to their employees. Last year, they raised 21 million. So in their financing section, they had a cash inflow of 245 million. Last year was a cash inflow of 604 million. This is the equity section on their 930 balance sheet. They have 2.5 billion of equity. They raised 2.6 billion from selling their business and they lost 55 million from running their business. Let's look at the capital structure. 2.5 billion of equity, 200 million of debt. They're 92% equity, 8% debt. And if they wanted to, they can pay off all the debt with the cash on their balance sheet and still have $2.3 billion of cash left over. I gave them the middle whack on Finbox, 8.8%, and that's a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year for that $7.2 billion. We discount those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $6.3 billion. We divide that by 77 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $82. They're trading at $82, so they're trading at a 1% discount. It's a buy according to the model, but it's pretty much where they're trading at. Their annual revenue is expected to decrease 1.5% a year. So I decrease their revenue 1.5% a year. That's how I got their future revenue estimates. To get their future free cash flows, I need to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. In the trailing 12 months, they converted 52% of their revenue to free cash flow. So I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 52%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. And it's pretty interesting. It's almost exactly where they're trading at. 13 analysts priced this stock and the average price target was 154. The low was 90, the high is 220. This is where the stock has been trading the last two years. So you can see it broke through $200 at one point. If you're investing in a biotech company that does not have an FDA approved drug, then the stock price usually goes up when they pass a clinical trial or when a big investor like Kathy Wood invests in a company. If an analyst raises their price target, then the stock may go up, investors may start buying it. Alternatively, if an analyst decreases their price target, then the stock will go down. The stock is well below half its peak, so it could be a good time to buy the stock. Unless you pick up the stock down here, you're probably down on your investment. So you could reduce your cost basis by dollar cost averaging down. They have a beta of 2.08, so the stock moves more than two times the market. It's a bit volatile. It's gone down 52% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 27%. The 52-week high is 220, the low is 67. 
and the stock is on a decline trading below its 50 day and 200 day moving average. 1.6 million shares are traded each day on this stock. Of the 77 million shares outstanding, 72 million are on float. When a share is on float, that means it's available for investors like me and you to purchase. More than half the shares are held by institutions and over 13% of the shares on float are shorted. So it has a pretty high short percentage. A positive sign is they're adding employees each year. They employ over 400 people. If you put $10,000 into this company when it started trading, you'd be at $60,000 today. That's a 41% annual return. The only insider activity I could find is a sell back in February of 171,000 shares. 58% of the shares are held by institutions and 41% by the general public. Kathy Wood's ARK Investment Fund owns 10% of the company. That's 7.6 million shares valued at over $600 million. The next biggest shareholder is Capital Research, then Nico Asset Management, SR1 Capital Management, Scott Rubin 1 Capital Management, and New Enterprise Associates. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have a pretty good PE of 15. That's better than the market median and average. PE is stock price over earnings per share. And the way you calculate earnings per share, it's net income over shares outstanding. Their price to sales is 6.9 and their price to book is 2.5. Here's a list of their non-current assets. They have 106 million of property and equipment. Here's a breakdown of that 106 million. 1.8 million of computer equipment, 3.4 million of furniture and fixtures, 33 million of laboratory equipment, 27 million of leasehold improvements, and 74 million of construction and process. That equals 139 million, but you depreciate those assets and they depreciated 33 million. So the book value, the value in a balance sheet is 106 million. They have 17 million of restricted cash. The restricted cash is for letters of credit. This money is to be used for its lease facilities. And they have 175 million of operating lease assets. This operating lease is for their laboratory in Boston. They have an amazing return on invested capital of 137%. They have a high ROE of 16%. They have a really high current ratio and quick ratio over 26. Here's a list of their current assets. 1 billion of cash, 1.5 billion of marketable securities. These are short term liquid investments and 41 million of prepaid expenses. Here's a list of their current liabilities, 10 million of accounts payable, 68 million of accrued expenses. Accrued expenses are expenses the company has incurred but hasn't paid it yet. Payroll and other employee related costs is 17 million. Research costs of 36 million. Professional fees of 3.6 million. Intellectual property costs, 5 million. Accrued property and equipment is 6 million. That sums up to the 68.3 million. They also have 1.6 million of deferred revenue, 3.3 million of accrued tax liabilities, and 12.6 million of operating lease liabilities. So they have operating leases on their asset section and their liability section. So they do seem to be well capitalized. They did generate 465 million of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months. Although going forward, at least over the next 12 months, they'll probably have negative free cash flow. They have 2.4 billion of working capital since they issued so much common stock. So it seems like they have enough cash to get through the next 12 months without doing another capital raise. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of 18 companies in the same industry as CRSP. And if they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So this industry tends to have pretty weak ratios. So they are better in all the price multiples. They have an extremely high current ratio. They do have a positive ROE, but in the third quarter it was negative. ROE is net income over equity, and the net income number I used was the trailing 12 months. They're lower than average in debt. They're not too small of a company, but they are small in the average company. So to summarize, I have them trading at intrinsic value, and there is a lot of promise with this company. They're linked up with a lot of big biotech companies currently, Bayer and Vertex. Also, they have big investors like Kathy Wood backing them. It does appear that their drugs are further ahead than the average startup biotech company. But I'm sure you've seen many, many biotech companies pop up and a lot of them fail. But the ones that do succeed make it really big. It's either all or nothing. You can't just be middle of the line with this industry. You either have a breakout drug 
or you have no drug at all. I rank their free cash flow is 9 out of 10, their revenue 9 out of 10, and their ratio is 8 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.